Welcome to the Wisp Mama Bear Podcast, Episode 30. I'm your host, Sarah Yacoub. Today's topic, Christmas. Merry Christmas. I hope today is one that can be spent warm by the fire, eating good food, in the company of loved ones, with reflection on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what His birth means to the world. For me, celebrating the birth of Jesus is a reminder to look to that which He taught and how He led by example. It's an opportunity to talk to our kids about who we strive to be as people and what we do with the gift and service that is our time on earth. For me, I love the challenge of finding gifts that our kids love that fits each and every one of their very different interests and personalities. I don't always hit the mark, but when I do, that look on their face is priceless. As a kid, we didn't have very much growing up. My brothers and I didn't get things just to get them. We either saved our money, collected and recycled cans, or waited for our birthday or Christmas to roll around. We didn't eat out a lot, So, with a steady rotation of chicken, rice, and broccoli, or spaghetti, Christmas dinner was also very exciting. Christmas was also the time of year we went to church. My mom would sit in the front seat of the car and remind us that, quote, Christmas is a holiday stolen from the pagans. As an adult, my mother-in-law would later educate me on what the Bible actually has to say about Christmas, or rather Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, and periodically ask my husband why we have a homage to male parts in our living room, referring to our Christmas tree. What is going on here? To be clear, they're right. Or, at least I think they're right. Jesus, by all scholarly accounts, was not born on December 25th. December 25th coincides with the pagan holiday winter solstice, as do the traditions we know to be associated with Christmas. In the 3rd century AD, the Roman Empire started celebrating Christmas. Emperor Constantine made Christianity the religion of the empire. Why? Well, it depends on who you ask. The cynic will tell you he did so as a way to start taxing the pagans. What does this change? For me, not much. Christmas is the day designated to honor the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I'm okay with that. I believe all parts of the Bible are instructive, But that instructive does not mean literal. Lessons can and often are communicated in many forms. As a longtime fan of Grey's Anatomy, the social commentary and lessons woven throughout that show serve as an example of how to teach without announcing the lesson. Christmas for me is a time of reflection. There is no shortage of Christmas music in our house come this time of year. In fact, prior to sitting down for today's podcast, a piano version of Ave Maria cycled through the mix. It was enough to stop me in my tracks. The last time I heard any version of Ave Maria, it was Christina Aguilera's tribute to Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna at their February 24th Celebration of Life ceremony. If you'll bear with me on the following tangent to Christmas, it's something that has been weighing on me for the better part of 2020. Kobe's death. While I can't imagine anyone is particularly good at grief, or sadness for that matter, I can safely say that I royally suck at it. I feel it, acknowledge I'm feeling it, and then proceed to try to rationalize my way out of not feeling it. With the death of Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the other seven people who so tragically lost their lives on January 26, 2020, I really struggled. I first asked myself why. People die all the time. The loss of any life is tragic, but I'm not typically reduced to a puddle of tears and feeling like the recipient of a swift kick to the gut any time I turn on the news. I grew up in Pasadena, where the 110 freeway that winds its way by the Coliseum, Staples Center, and Dodger Field literally starts, or ends depending on your perspective, in my relatively small hometown. I remember my little brother telling us at the dinner table that Kobe Bryant was coming to the Lakers straight out of high school. I was 12, Josh was 9. We watched Kobe grow up, and in many ways we grew up with him. We watched him evolve from a cocky kid to a man-child, and eventually a man. Colorado, July 2003, summer going into my sophomore year of college. As a woman, a woman who knows trauma, and someone who knows the statistics, my inclination is to believe survivors until provided compelling evidence to believe in the contrary. 
only a small percentage of sexual assault is actually reported. And playing the odds, it's exponentially more likely for that survivor to be telling the truth than to be making a false report. I had friends who played basketball in college. They shared the rumors floating around the locker room. Having been a practicing deputy district attorney for one of the largest and most respected prosecutorial offices in the country, if not the world, I have questions and could understand how a jury could have gone either way had it gone to trial. Watching what Kobe did with his second chance, who he grew to be, was inspiring, and I believe in redemption. While the question of redemption is well above my pay grade, I believe Kobe was a definite contender. Along the path of trying to rationalize my way out of grief, I wondered if it's that at the time he and Gianna died, my stepdaughter was of a similar age and also played basketball, that my husband and I have two small children about the ages of Vanessa and Kobe's youngest girls, that my oldest stepdaughter is similar in age to their oldest daughter, and how devastated we would all be in the face of that sort of loss. I remember when Princess Diana died. I was at my grandparents' cabin in Arnold, California, We watched on an old small television with less than great reception. I was 13. When Michael Jackson died, I was sitting in a room with the district attorneys working on the Anna Nicole Smith case. LAPD came in and presented one of the DAs with a police report. I had an opportunity to read it. It was surreal. I was in Santa Barbara and interning for the Santa Barbara District Attorney's Office during Michael Jackson's sexual assault trial. I interned for the Los Angeles County District Attorney who handled Michael Jackson's Los Angeles sexual assault case. I've had enough conversations over the years, seen enough of the evidence firsthand, that I have no doubt that he serially preyed on children. While the world mourned his loss, I wondered how many children breathed a sigh of relief. I also wondered how it is that musical brilliance was enough to make people all around the world turn a blind eye to the sexual assault of children. For many years, it became a family tradition of sorts for, quote, Santa to send my dad, brothers, and I to the Christmas Day Lakers home game. Santa would then have an entire kitchen to prepare Christmas dinner in peace and quiet. I've been to more Laker games than I can count. I even used to drive around with one of those goofy Laker flags on my back car window. They were my team. I think what I admire most about Kobe is not only his work ethic, but that he embodied true strength and leadership. Weak leaders won't actually seek to strengthen those around them because they are too threatened and they are too busy competing within their own team. Competing within your own team is more or less the equivalent to shooting yourself in the foot and expecting to be able to run. It's silly. Strong leaders like Kobe aren't threatened by the greatness of others. They understand that their own greatness is a function of themselves and no one else. They understand that strengthening others only stands to strengthen their team. Seems like a simple enough concept, right? Unfortunately, at least in my experience, leaders like Kobe are rare. At the same time, I recognize that leaders like Kobe aren't for everyone, so maybe their limited supply is fortunate from some perspectives. Some people do not thrive in an atmosphere that looks for and pushes for the best. Some people find the quest for self-improvement intimidating and too much. I continue to try to understand and empathize with those people, as that is not my instinct or a position to which I can relate, enabled in mediocrity or weaknesses that are a detriment not only to myself but to others around me, sounds like it could be one of the seven layers of hell. Maybe it is. I don't know. 2020 was a hard year that brought a lot of heartache and took a lot of lives. To everyone for whom this is your first Christmas without a loved one, you are in my prayers. To everyone struggling through this COVID economy, you are in my prayers. It is easy when threatened or in times of uncertainty to put up walls to mask vulnerability with anger. It's not inherently irrational. Subconsciously, it's like getting big and scary so as to spook off the bear. If we scare off that bear, it can't get close enough to hurt us. It's a metaphor that can be plugged into all sorts of scenarios. This Christmas, I am praying for God's warmth, light, and love to shine brightly upon us all, to let us know that it is not up to us to have to scare off the proverbial bear, and to know that we are safe and loved. To all those who are celebrating today, Merry Christmas. Episode 31 on Monday. See you there.